CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Welcome to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. And uh, we talk about these types of issues quite frequently on Tim Graham and Friends. I'm thinking about uh, Marcel Louis Jacques and what happened at 97 Rock. Uh, we've talked about other things that have come up in the community in terms of journalism topics. We're not afraid to back away from that. Uh, had Matt Beauvais on to talk about his infamous Jack Eichel uh, clip when he returned to KeyBank Center last year. Uh, we like to, to talk about that. Uh, Joan and I both teach journalism classes here at local colleges, uh, Canisius for me, Madai for Jonah. And uh, we had a rather significant learning experience take place in Western New York over uh, the weekend and into uh, early part of this week. Of course, I'm talking about uh, Jerry Sullivan, uh, who was fired uh, over misogynistic comments uh, by both of his uh, journalism employers, uh, WIVB Channel 4, and also the Niagara Gazette, and uh, should, uh, for the sake of full disclosure, uh, and for the next five or 10 minutes that we address this, Jonah Bronstein uh, does work for both places. It's very difficult for him to comment in many ways regarding uh, what happened with Jerry, uh, because he does not make policy for Next Star. Uh, there, was, uh, there are corporate decisions that are made as to what to say and what not to say. That is way above Jonah's pay grade. Uh, similar things have happened with me, uh, not only at the Buffalo News, but at The Athletic, for instance, uh, when Trevor Bauer, I think there still is litigation ongoing uh, that uh, did, uh, but no longer uh, involves The Athletic. We're instructed we can't talk about it. Don't go on a radio show. And if you're asked about it, you're not allowed to speak on it because there are legal ramifications and public relations ramifications. So anyway, uh, Jonah, uh, understandably, can't say uh, everything uh, that might be on his mind, and I'm not going to ask him. And I don't think that uh, it should be a reflection um, of what he does or does not say here on the podcast uh, as to whether or not uh, this is a serious issue, because it's a very serious issue. And what Jerry said uh, is indefensible. Uh, it's very disappointing of, uh, to me as a friend of Jerry's for 22 years. I've known him 23 years. Um, I think that uh, he got what he deserved. You know, when this happened on Monday night, I believe it was, uh, it was pretty immediate. I said, that's the end of Jerry. Uh, he's going to lose his jobs. And the next day he did. Uh, I don't think it was a long time coming though, which is the thing that is really difficult to square uh, with Jerry Sullivan, who is a liberal, very progressive minded person. Um, an astute social commentator. And I think that that's where the learning uh, part of this comes in or the teaching, uh, the teaching moment uh, comes in uh, is that uh, I think that sometimes you lose touch. Sometimes you lose, uh, you used to have your finger on the pulse. And I think very few people in Western New York sports history going back to the founding of the Bills and the Sabres and whatever else came before that, few people had their finger on the pulse of Buffalo sports like Jerry Sullivan. But not working uh, full-time in sports, not being in a newsroom on an everyday basis, not being in an office uh, environment on a day-to-day -day basis, not interacting with people of different ages and generations, um, I think you lose your ability to read the room. Jerry also was an infamous curmudgeon uh, who liked to, he was proud of the fact that technology baffled him. 
Uh, social media was something that confounded him uh, at times. And I think his inability to pick up on that uh, and to understand that. Um, and, and here's the thing, I guess I'm getting too far down the road. I, I, I do want to say this as somebody who does know Jerry or has, has known Jerry for 22 years. I don't believe that what he said is what's in his heart. However, I said, I don't believe that. He said what he said. You can hear him say it. You can see him say it because it's on video. And that trumps what I believe is in Jerry Sullivan's heart, even after 22 years. From a professional standpoint, of course, I'm talking. This is why it would have been very difficult for him to show up in the Buffalo Bills press box on Saturday night with so many other women who are in sports, women who work in sports journalism, work for the Bills, for Pagula Sports and Entertainment, or if he were to attend the Sabres game uh, against um, Colorado, who, who'd they play? Whoever they play, the LA Kings uh, the following night. Um, so what we believe is in his heart doesn't necessarily matter anymore. And I think that's the teachable moment. I heard from a former Bills, two former Bills players, in fact, reached out to me because they felt bad for Jerry, but also understood that it takes – the one and he probably has used this before. So maybe I'm outing him by uh, using his phrase. It takes four years to build a reputation and four seconds to wreck it. And that is exactly what happened. So again, I, I think it's something that can happen to all of us. If we, and I'm not saying that Jerry stuck around too long either. You, if you read his column off of Sunday's bills game, it was great. It was maybe the best analysis written about the bills and their offense of anybody who was there and people who are in the locker room every day and who talk to Josh Allen once or twice a week and all that stuff. Jerry still has his fastball. Um, but it was, I think his, his inability or he it atrophied maybe to the point where he lost his ability to interact or to understand how people are going to react to what you say and being provocative or a throwaway line that you think in your head might be funny and it doesn't come out the right way. Sorry. Uh, there are no take backs, uh, in when it's on camera and it's a gotcha moment. Um, I do think that there was, because Jerry had such a, um, uh, controversial reputation, among Buffalo sports fans, there were people who wanted to see Jerry gone for 10 years. Uh, they talk about his shtick or his act, which I didn't really think it was a shtick or a shtick or an act that he was a passionate guy and he believed we, what he wrote about sports. Uh, there's this, um, there's this feeling, I think from a lot of sports fans that say we finally got him. But again, like I said, he got what he deserved, but this was not a long time coming. This is not something that Jerry said. This isn't like we find, like he's been saying these things in, uh, in, over a couple of beers at the bar where you're like, hey, Jerry, come on, man. I mean, we know those people that, you know, they show up to work and don't say the things that they say in, in private. But Jerry never said these things in private. So that's why it's so disappointing to me. It's a cautionary tale uh, for journalism. I am certainly going to use it for my class. Uh, at Canisius College. I think that Jerry, um, knowing how he thinks about these types of things, will try to own it. He might even come in as a guest and speak about it to my class at Canisius College. Um, but anyway, um, I just wanted to address it. I know it's, uh, it's difficult. I didn't want to hide from it just because Jerry is someone I've known and, and worked with for 22 years. I didn't want to make it seem as though, all right, well, I'm not going to talk about this one. This one's too tricky. Um, this is the one that, uh, compared to Marcel Louis Jacques and Rob Lederman and, you know, the, those racist comments that cleared out an entire morning show on 97 rock. Um, this is every bit as big. Uh, this is on Fox news. Fox news loved the dunk on the liberal who got canceled. Um, but he deserved it. Yeah, there's no, no two ways about it. I'm not going to, I can't defend what he said. Uh, it eclipses, I think what I believe about him. Um, because again, my belief is now at odds with what I heard and what I saw on that video and what the world has now heard and saw on the video. And, uh, I, I can't, uh, I can't, I can't, I think there, there was a, 
my knee jerk reaction, my knee jerk reaction in times when people have attacked Jerry is to stand up for Jerry. Same as I would for John Waro or many other people who uh, people love to dunk on him. Uh, when you and I happened to be together when this happened, Jonah, and when we saw it, we looked at each other and I think we both, we saw, I could see it in each other's eyes. You know, that's the end of Jerry. We knew it. And it's not, uh, that's the, that's the reality of it. And again, I just want to reiterate if you, if you want to, if you're the type of person who skips past the CTBK, uh, ad at the beginning of the podcast, and maybe you didn't hear my preamble, it's difficult for Jonah to talk about it. Uh, so Jonah, I don't know, is there anything, do you, anything you want to say at all, uh, before we move on or any points to make? Well, I think you summed up, um, our feelings pretty well on it and spoke about it more eloquently than maybe I would be capable of. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, it's a difficult thing for me to comment on for various reasons, uh, even, you know, emotionally to really just kind of deal with it and, and express my thoughts and feelings on it. And, you know, Jerry's a family with- member. Jerry is a, a Jerry is closer to me than my own brother. Uh, and my own sister, I would even say, I mean, my brother that they, you know, I've been, I've spent more time with Jerry than I have my brother and my sister over the last 22 years. Um, I've had more private moments with Jerry, uh, than my brother and my sister. Um, we, we also have that family member who, you know, does, does something that you, that's, that you can't defend and you want to jump, you want to rush to their defense, but, um, I, I think it's important to when people who love you even um, can say, uh, look, you fucked up and you got to you got to find a way to fix it because I can't I can't do it for you. Uh, you're going to have to whether it through through deeds or words or whatever it is over time. I don't know if Jerry has that in his constitution at his age to try to make a comeback. I I don't think so. I think he was, he needed to be coaxed out of retirement to, to do the jobs that he was doing. Um, So I I don't know if he just fades away, uh, but I really don't think that there's a way that, that you can, that you come, you come back from that without really putting in a lot of, a lot of work. Yeah. And, and as you mentioned, you called Jerry a family member. For me, he's one of my favorite people that I've met in this business. And in many ways, I think him and you, probably two of my biggest role models in local sports oh, media. Christ. Yeah. So maybe I'm not good at picking role models. But, um, you know, I, and that's, I think, why it's difficult. It's, um, you know, I think it's tough when someone that you consider a role model does something that then you don't want to follow that as a model. And, uh, you know, I guess maybe fortunately in my personal life, you know, I have a father and I don't think he's ever done anything that I'm embarrassed about, but that's how it feels like when you have like, kind of like your own, you know, you gotta be, you know, you gotta deal with something that your own family member did that you, you have to try to defend or try to work your way around. And it's, it's very hard to do it. And, and, and I don't condone anything he said, and I don't agree with anything he said uh, in this situation. So I think it's just sad for everybody all, all the way around the people who were hurt, by the comment and everybody hurt by the aftermath of the comment. And I, it doesn't seem like there's any winners in this game this week. No, you know, there's a flipping attitude uh, with Jerry uh, that uh, at his best, that's part of his charm, but the, the unwillingness to kind of stay up to date with things and uh, be around and, you know, almost, like I said, it was a source of pride. It was part of his, his thing. Like I'm the guy who, who doesn't get all this technology, you know, I don't get all this Twitter and TikTok and all that stuff. And it ended up being his, his inability to understand the reach and the audience and the fact that you are with two young guys, younger guys, uh, over beers, uh, it doesn't just stay among the three of you. You're not just making a flippant remark that you can come back 20 minutes later and say, ah, you know, I don't really mean that, or I didn't, or, or you you flesh it out over time. You know, by the way, I would like to say, I I, real quick, and I don't want to excuse Jerry for that, but congratulations, train wreck sports. You got an out of touch sports writer to come on your 
your show and give him some beers and loosen him up and, uh, and uh, help him end his career. So I hope that that's a badge of honor for you guys. That's not to excuse Jerry, but he certainly has been exploited by train wreck sports throughout all this. Uh, and I think it's shameful. Uh, the, the clicks, and I hope the clicks in the cloud is, is worth it. Uh, and it's not, uh, it's not, it's, it's the lack of disavowal. I mean, you get fine. The, it happened. You don't want to run from it, but nodding alongside Jerry, um, and not, not having the courage to say something about it, but then gladly accepting the traffic and, uh, and, and pandering, uh, to the, the heel aspect of it was, it was, it made an unfortunate situation even worse. I, I actually, I, I've, I've thought about those guys. Uh, I thought I liked them, but, um, not, not exactly, a a, a, a master class in, uh, in character. Um, again, I'm not blaming them for what Jerry said. I'm just, uh, I think it's interesting that they were very quick to, to exploit it though. Um, and if I could clarify one thing, I mean, as we both said, we feel badly, uh, for a lot of people for, for Jerry and the rest of us aligned with Jerry in, in various ways, but also I feel badly for any, um, any sports fan, male or female, but specifically the females and female journalists and anybody who was hurt by what he said. And, and this isn't like an apology. If you were offended, it's a, I'm feel badly that something was said that did offend people and that they had to, uh, you know, hear that and, and have whatever feelings associated with that. When, when I don't think, as you said, I don't think that was the intention to say something hurtful like that, but it was said and people were hurt. Yeah. I think, uh, I think of the, yeah, a lot of the diehard sports fans in my life, uh, sports fans and sports journalists who were women. Um, you know, I, th I think of, you know, and I'm not bringing up her name because of where she works, but I work alongside her in the studio. I think of Heather Prusak and I see she busts her ass. She works, she works. And she comes up with stuff uh, for our shows, uh, for the pregame shows. And I didn't think to come up with that, or I didn't know where she got it or whatever. She went and does the research and the, 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 the amount of information that she sits down with, and she's only going to have a total of 10 minutes to say it. I know she's not going to, she's going to get to maybe 10% of it, but she's got so much there, uh, in terms of her prep. Um, you know, there, there are so many, and I, if I start naming them and then people are going to wonder why I didn't name all of them, but, uh, you know, it's, um, there, I did, that was one of my first thoughts on Monday night going into Tuesday morning after this happened is how is Jerry going to show up in the press box on Saturday night for that dolphins game? And what is going to, what kind of emotional aspect will there be to all those women who will be sitting in front of him behind him and to the right and to the left of him, he would be surrounded by proud, uh, sports employees, whether it be journalism or working in the front office or whatever, and walking in and out of that stadium, you know, you gotta, you gotta walk a little bit to get from the media parking lot to the, to the press box. You have to walk past an awful lot of women wearing their bills gear, uh, who were there for the game, who are willing to sit through the, you know, projected seven inches of snow at, uh, yeah, I, I feel for them because it, Jerry is one of the most prominent voices in Western New York sports history. And one of the most, and so with that comes great responsibility. He wants, and he built up his reputation over the years to be a guy that you had to listen to. He was proud of that. You had to listen to him. And so he had the, a stage uh, that has been taken away from him, rightfully so, over the last 72 hours. Uh, but on that stage to pronounce, make a pronouncement like he did in that span of five, 10 seconds, I think hurt a lot of people and uh, disappointed a lot of people who, who need, uh, uh, who, are, who are easily stepped on and written off and taken for granted and told all the time uh, to go make me a sandwich, uh, your roles in the kitchen. You see it all the time. And on social media from anybody who is a woman and take, take a look at me, anything that Mina Kimes from ESPN tweets, uh, Sarah Spain, um, 
so many national uh, female um, uh, journalists and what they have to put up with. Um, nothing about their opinion. Well, or if, if it, it's either crapping on their opinion or telling them how hot they are and not even listening to their opinion um, or telling them how ugly they are or that you shouldn't be on TV. It's just so much shit that men don't have to put up with. Um, okay, uh, let's take a break. Uh, and in a few seconds, uh, we'll talk about the Sabres and the Bills. Uh, but for now, I wanted the first segment uh, to be about what I felt was an important issue uh, that had to be addressed. The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716 716- 630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome back to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK. Uh, Jonah, a uh, big ball game Saturday night. Let's jump right into that. Miami Dolphins in Highmark Stadium with the Bills having a chance to avenge that loss earlier in the season that kind of seems like an outlier. At least we've uh, been talking about it as an outlier since it happened because of all the injuries the Bills were facing, uh, the oppressive heat, players dropping on the field, cramps, all that type of stuff. The Dolphins were able to handle the weather much uh, more smoothly. Um your, your thoughts on, on this matchup, the Bills still heavily favored. We're supposed to have snow after the Dolphins are coming from the West Coast, and uh, maybe it will be uh, equilibrium attained regarding uh, the weather conditions between uh, the game in Miami Gardens and the rematch in Orchard Park. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's an entirely, obviously, entirely different weather and entirely different weather effect on this football game than the first time the two teams played in Miami. Um, I don't know if we talked about this in the podcast the first time, but it underscores the point that uh, the home game against the Dolphins should be in Buffalo in September and the game in Miami should be later in the season. And they seem to never get that correct, but it's going to be, uh, it's going to snow. and It might be a very large amount of snow and a very difficult travel situation getting in and out of the stadium. And then the game itself will probably be affected by the weather conditions. And we would assume that it will affect the Dolphins more negatively than the Bills. Although last week with some cold rain and wind and a little bit of snow, we've seen how Buffalo type weather, Orchard Park, Lake Effect snow type weather that should be a home field advantage for the Bills might not always be a home field advantage for this team and this offense the way it's built right now. But I think it's going to hurt Miami even worse. And Miami is a very good team with a very good offense, very good receivers, and Tua is having an excellent season when he's been healthy. But over the past couple of weeks, it has not been as good of an offense, and it does seem like maybe opposing defensive have figured out how to defend Mike McDaniel's attack and what they've been doing and combine that with the weather and the way the Bills' defense through the injuries has played excellent over the past four games. It, I think this is going to be not an easy win for the Bills, but an easier matchup than it was the first two times the first time these two teams met yeah it'll it'll be interesting to see what kind of track uh these uh dolphins receivers have uh at their disposal if they're slipping around in the snow i mean but uh, you know the the narrative about the bills and when it's uh, too tough for them it's just right for us and uh, the the famous marv levy uh saying I'm, I'm referring to and just this belief that because the bills are from western new york that they handle these conditions better you know, there are a couple of examples where the Bills have uh, had uh, really bad weather conditions and not been the better team um, or got lucky. Uh, I'm thinking back to uh, the Snowvertime game against the Indianapolis Colts, a dome team. Uh, the Bills got su- super lucky uh, in that game. 
um, pulling it out at the end. Sean McDermott was actually playing for the tie, which would have eliminated him from the playoffs. And you know, I've written about that. And Eric Wood, uh, you know, who's uh, who's talked about his argument that he had with Sean McDermott on the sideline about punting late in the game that seemed like it was going for a tie. And of course, they they just they pulled it out of a snowbank uh, and won that game against a dome team. And then just last season, there was a, a fine example of Matt Ryan. Uh, and the Atlanta Falcons coming to Orchard Park late in the season, cold, sloppy conditions. Um, uh, Matt Ryan's record in in the cold weather uh, it was abysmal and also quite um, short, meaning he hadn't done it much. Uh, but when he had, it didn't go well. Well, Matt Ryan shows up and, and looks like a pro bowler. Uh, and Josh Allen struggles, goes 11 for 26 for 120 yards and three interceptions. That's the game when the Bills just had to run it. They found a way to, to come back and, and beat the Falcons with Devin Singletary rushing for 110 yards. Um, the Bills pulled that one out 29 to 15 with a couple of late touchdowns. But um, that all being said, so here I am about to give you some stats that maybe don't matter. Uh, to a tag of Aloha in 50 degrees or colder. Now, he went to Alabama. Uh, he uh, has played in, in, in Miami his entire career. Three times in his career, he's played in 50 degrees or colder. November 22nd, 2020 at Denver. January 3rd, 2021 at Buffalo. January 2nd, 2022 at Nashville. He is 0-3. He has completed 55% of his passes for 649 yards, two touchdowns, four interceptions, 11 sacks, three fumbles, one of them lost. And, well, can Tua do anything about running in this weather? Well, eight carries for 29 yards, no touchdowns. Let me just give you a rundown of those scores of those games. I guess I, I left that out. Uh, in Denver, a 20-13 to 13 loss. In Orchard Park, a 56-26 to 26 loss. That was 35 degrees. In Nashville, a 34 to three loss to the Tennessee Titans. So, to a tag of Aloha, uh, does not seem to do very well uh, in these conditions. Of course, you can then say, well, did he have Jalen Waddell and Tyreek Hill in those games? Uh, eh, that's a good comeback, uh, but uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what this guy from from Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, does uh, if they get even three or four inches of snow in Orchard Park on Saturday night. Well, it seems like we might be lucky enough to see another game with 10 consecutive punts. <laughs> right. That would be uh, a blessing. Um, the Bills Let are a little ask, banged up. So are the Dolphins. No, go ahead, Jonah. Well, I want to ask you a bit about the weather in the stadium. You wrote something pretty interesting on The Athletic a few weeks back before the game got moved to Detroit or while it was being moved to Detroit about how a dome stadium wouldn't have prevented that situation. Uh, I think what we might see on Saturday is the situation that a, a roof on the stadium would prevent having to play through the elements and having the fans have to sit through the elements. But I don't know, maybe if you could tell us a little bit about why a dome stadium doesn't solve all of the problems with uh, not, not problems, but doesn't solve all of the issues related to uh, the Bills playing in this climate? Well, it has to do with snow removal uh, more than really if the snow is falling on you or um, how cold you are, how much you're enjoying uh, the game for the four or five hours you're at the stadium. I mean, I'm, I'm including the before the game. Um, it, it's a situation where uh, that game that was moved to Detroit against the Browns Erie County needed every bit of its infrastructure and resources for snow plows, EMS, law enforcement, um, all of those types of things that it couldn't divert what you need for however many tens of thousands of people would have shown up for this game. Uh, traffic in and out of the stadium is, is a luxury, whether that stadium was in downtown and had a dome on it or was in Orchard Park with, with open air. Uh, that game would have been moved no matter what. So there is no, uh, th there was this knee jerk reaction of, well, the game, we, we wouldn't have lost a home game if there was a dome. No, the game was going to be moved no matter what, uh, because 
Uh, it has to do with being able to get to the stadium. There were driving bans. Mark Poland cars tweeted it out uh, that uh, it's illegal for your employer to make you violate a driving ban to either get to work or if you are if your office or your workplace is in a place where there's a driving ban, right? Which means the bills broke the law, or at least Erie County helped the bills break the law to get their uh, uh, their players and staff out of the South Towns and to the airport that magically opened up a couple hours before uh, the bills flight uh, needed to leave for Detroit. Uh, which was 100% uh, uh, had 100% attendance, which is amazing in and of itself. But yeah, some rules were bent. Uh, but uh, that would have been a game that would have been illegal to attend if you were a fan, you know, theoretically, uh, because there were driving bans. Um, illegal to attend as a fan, illegal to show up to as a player, uh, you know, all that stuff, uh, security. So, anyways, uh, it, I illegally. It was, I illegally attended a game under those circumstances before during the October storm, UB played in an empty stadium and the players in the media were the only people there. I illegal. I think I've illegally attended uh, Sabres games that have been ha- had issues with driving bands and, uh, or moved or changed or whatever. Um, yeah. I mean, it's uh, and, and a point was made, uh, I believe it was in the Q and a that I did with Bill's uh, Chief Operating Officer Ron Rakuya. Um, games in arenas get moved all the time. Arenas have roofs on them. Uh, Madison Square Garden, you know, there are Knicks games and Rangers games and Islanders games out on Long Island. And, you know, there are games in probably the Minnesota Wild have had games postponed or needed to be moved or played in a, whatever. That happens. And it has nothing to do with the fact that there's no roof on well, Madison Square sure. Garden. A dome stadium, I mean, I'm sure there's maybe a way they could build it to be more weather resilient, but a dome stadium might collapse under four feet of lake effect snow. It might, or it well, might it be something well, like sure. the Tonawanda Golf Dome that blows down. And Well, the weather. Minnesota Vikings. The Minnesota Vikings, their dome collapsed. Now, that was one of those air pressure uh, domes that I think are frowned upon now. I don't know if the NFL is ever going to build another one of those again, but uh, think of um, the Superdome and Hurricane Katrina. Um, a dome stadium was destroyed uh, by bad weather. Uh, so the elements can make you, you know, if it, uh, you know, the mechanisms that are required, the, the delicate mechanisms that are required for a retractable roof or all the different things. Yeah. It, it could make it just as hard uh, to, uh, to maintain. Now, uh, interesting thing that I, I think I knew it, but it was reminded of me when I did that Q and a with Ron Rakuya. Um, there is going to be so much radiant heat within the stadium, the new stadium that, uh, you know, how ever, usually once a year, uh, there's a call for shovelers uh, to shovel out um, Highmark Stadium or Ralph Wilson Stadium or Rich Stadium, whatever it was. And it, it's for a couple of reasons you need it is because um, the way it's constructed, the snow just sits there. There's only one tunnel. Uh, whereas most stadiums have multiple tunnels, maybe even as many as four tunnels that you can truck it out. Whereas in this stadium, it all has to be sent into one part of the lower bowl and then trucked out. And then the trucks can't get around the concourses. So you have to send actual human beings and not machinery up into the 300 levels and whatever. So this is going to have radiant overhead heating. The field is going to be heated um, underneath. So the, you probably won't see a situation like you did for snover time or might like you might see Saturday night against the dolphins where you're constantly clearing the field and it's all hands on deck uh, with a shovel. So the referees can see the yard lines. Um, the, the, the way this new stadium will be built um, you know, the snow shouldn't uh, collect a, as much on the field. Now, all that said, if last week's game or and this week's game underscores, some reasons why many believe that a uh, covered roof stadium is better than an open air stadium. And there's other reasons we've talked about why maybe during the off season and for multi-purpose usage that an indoor facility is better. Is that completely off the table? Could that part of the deal ever be renegotiated? I know there's it's, it's done. It's done. It's gone. It's over. Uh, the, it, it would, it would create, uh, there's so much more expense that goes into the roof. Um, 
And then you even had the question of, well, if it was in downtown, you wouldn't have to worry about the snow belt as much. Well, yes, you would, because the city of Buffalo uh, would need the resources also. And you're, are you then going to rely on the city of Buffalo's infrastructure as, as compared to the Erie County's in, um, in term, uh, not resources, I should say? Who would you rather worry uh, uh, rely upon in an emergency situation, Jonah? City of Buffalo? emergency response or resources or Erie County and or the state of New York um, or the National Guard, of course. But if if the first line of defense or the first bit is the city of Buffalo um, and you live on these side streets and in these houses that are older with, you know, uh, you know, it's. Anyways, you have you have people with certain needs in the city of Buffalo uh, who can't afford to. Uh, have your EMS crew at the stadium because it's required by law by the NFL to have ambulances there and security and police and traffic and all that stuff while the city is suffering and you can't get out of your house for three days uh, and an ambulance can't get down your your narrow street. Yeah, although, and I realize this will never happen either, but there's Northtown suburbs and areas of Niagara County that are not in the snow belt. And another yeah, that doesn't get quite as much snow as Toronto, Canada. <laughs> That's true. Uh, I still would love, and in my reporting, I couldn't find a source that would tell me, uh, you know, one of those sites that was looked at in the very early stages of um, the research that was being done on the various sites, and it really came down to Orchard Park or um, uh, the old First Ward there off uh, South Park Avenue. That site with uh, the um, um, what I'm drawing a blank. I'm, I'm having a brain cramp. Perry project, the Perry projects. Yes. Uh, I could think of the Admiral part. I couldn't think of, uh, Admiral Perry, uh, projects that site. Um, there was a, another site that was looked at briefly, uh, and it was on the UB North campus and I wrote about it. And so, you know, if you Google, you know, those things, you can, you can find that, but governor Cuomo, ruled it out almost immediately. And I could never find out why. And of course, Governor Cuomo quickly became former Governor Cuomo during this uh, reporting uh, that I did. And he just wasn't doing interviews anymore for some reason, Jonah. He was kind of hard to get before the fact. And then after the fact, I don't think that he wanted to explain why uh, that happened. But I'm curious to know why. Uh, I, I think that I would did. be a good location. I asked around a little bit at UB about that, and I didn't get any official comments and even the people that talked to me about it didn't know the official reasoning but their speculation was that that wouldn't have been good for that wouldn't have worked for the overall university layout and how you know they, they didn't want an nfl football stadium the state didn't want an nfl football stadium on the campus that other there were ancillary reasons why that was a no -go. but right but why i would like to know that because i as you know, I covered a lot of the nitty gritty of the decision making in this process. And I would just, at least for the record, would like to know what the reasoning was, or maybe they have plans for that plot of land uh, that was, or maybe, I don't know, but I would like to have gotten a reason and I could never find out specifically why. It also could come down, this is my speculation, I think it could come down to the fact that if it was on UB state land, then UB would want to own and control the stadium in ways that they're not able to with the bills. It wouldn't have been the same. Well, the state has taken over. Control. The state has taken over on this lease. It's not Erie County's building anymore. It's going to be the state's building. But it seems like day to day and in season management, the bills treat it like their home facility in ways that maybe UB would not have. True, but UB fun. would probably be able to play its football games there. Um, but what if there's a weekend where both want to play? Who who gets to decide and who who gets? They're to able both, to do that. To I mean, practice. UNLV and the and the Las Vegas Raiders do it. I mean, that happens. Pit the uh, Pit Panthers and the Steelers they share a facility. Um, I'm guessing that the Bills would trump UB and UB would play. You know, practice in its field house, or there'd be a facility that's that's built in as part of the whole stadium complex that UB would get its space. Right. But I think that's maybe the conflict. I think if it was on UB's land, I think UB would say that we get the 
trump the bills and the bills would say well we're the bills and we've always had this sure autonomy over our own practice fields and facilities and even just weight rooms and parking lots and how things get used it might be an awkward yeah, that would be baked into the lease all that type of stuff um but ub would be getting a, a football stadium out of it so i would think that they would appreciate that i would think so too uh, I, I mean i think it would it, we've talked about how this would have to be in conjunction with the state investing more into ub football and wanting a football program that needed a 60,000 seat stadium because right now they don't and i don't know if all of that was aligned with uh if everybody was aligned and wanting to make that investment. Jonah, your thoughts on these Sabres? Uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, everybody was uh, ready to write them off. And here we go. Typical Sabres teasing me, getting me worked up at the beginning of the season and then falling apart. Well, here these Sabres are uh, pretty damn interesting. Um, six goals in a period, twice in a in an eight-day stretch. Uh, Tage Thompson, again, I, I've said it a hundred times, it feels like, seems to be able to score whenever the hell he wants. Uh, Alex Tuck playing incredibly well. Uh, uh, Rasmus Dahlin, of course, he's actually faded a little bit. He's off the pace uh, for a hundred point season since I wrote about how he might be uh, the greatest two-way defenseman in Sabres history already. Uh, and as outrageous as that may seem, tell me who else uh, the answer would be, which is kind of the point of my story. Um, these guys are a lot of fun to watch, even after 40 minutes of really dull offensive hockey, 41 year old Craig Anderson gets his first shutout in three and a half years. Uh, I'm not saying that these guys are rolling to the playoffs, but this is, I think all, this is what fans deserve at minimum. If you're not going to be a playoff team, at least entertain us. And they finally got to that point. Yeah, they're the highest scoring team in the league. They're ninth in goal differential. They have young, exciting players, at least on the offensive end, that are fun to watch and have highlight pretty goals night after night. Um, so, and they're competitive in most every game. They don't win every game, but it, there have been very few um, stinkers where the Sabres like really didn't show up and weren't competitive. And you would have maybe regretted buying your ticket and going to watch the game. They've been especially good wearing these black and red throwback jerseys. They won all three of those games and scored six goals each of those times. And it wasn't looking like it was going to be one of those type of games the other night. It was 0-0 after two periods, and the Sabres only had three shots in the first period. And then, lo and behold, they get six in the third, and it is one of those uh, big wins with six goals. I am curious. I mean, I think we know some of the reasons why, but I am curious that the way they're playing hasn't really juiced attendance quite yet. They've had some bigger crowds on some bigger nights, but it doesn't seem like they've gotten very many games where there was a good walk-up draw because they played well the night before because Tate Thompson had five goals and everybody got a little bit excited to go see him the next time out. So they're still missing that uh, spark that ignites the fan base. And I think some of that is related to the bills and the weather and the time of the year, but it's it, the it, bills. I think, I think people are so focused on the bills that it's hard to actually be passionate about two things at once, as strange as that may seem. And there's a lot of money being spent on the bills, not just on tickets, but on the jerseys here. It is Christmas time. Uh, I happen to know, uh, through sources that there is a major backlog on Sabres uh, jerseys. Uh, so people are buying them. Of course, Tage Thompson and Darlene and Cousins, Dylan Cousins, another guy. I mean, there's so many guys that you can get behind uh, as a young fan or even as an old fan um, that these guys are going to be here for a while. Um, but, you you know, the, the Bills jerseys that the, I mean, there's a, so much money that gets spent. Uh, that I think it gets to the point and hockey tickets are expensive because it is so dependent on the gate uh, that the NFL, I think, could charge more than it does in some cases, uh, but knows it's going to get its money elsewhere that the NHL does not have that revenue stream of just big time broadcast money left and right. It's much better than it used to be, but still it's a box office driven sport. And so they really have to charge every last cent. Uh, for tickets and, and well, let's face, I mean, hell if you, an authentic bills Jersey versus an authentic Sabres hockey jerseys are freaking expensive and there's so many of them. So I think that 
you know, this is anecdotal. I don't have the data behind it, but to me, it seems as like if you're a passionate hockey fan, there are so many other ways to spend your money before you get to a ticket. Whereas if you're a bills fan, you want to be there. And there are other obviously ways to be a bills fan and, and spend your money too, but it just seems different to me. And maybe I'm wrong, but that's no, just, no, a, I think you, you touch on many of the reasons why attendance is lagging, but I just, Comparing apples to apples, it seems like the way the Sabres are playing, that we should be seeing bigger crowds in December than we did in November and and such and so forth. And that hasn't really played out quite yet. Penguins game that I attended last Friday, I think it was the, the, the first in the home and home. So yeah, it was Friday night. The, the cheers were louder for Penguins goals than for Sabres goals. And the, so it was a nice crowd, but everybody came to see Sidney Crosby or you are from Erie and can't get into the the penguin stadium or it's too expensive you can buy tickets on the secondary market or come across from southern ontario and see sid the kid uh you know because those times are are running out so yeah i think that uh you do have that and then the king's game that i was at on monday night what was that tuesday whatever the hell night it was monday night monday night um Tuesday night. Tuesday night. Yeah, it was. Yeah, because we were talking there about Jerry and it had happened the night before. Um, yeah, it was dull. I mean, it was there was not a Sabres crowd there, really. Even, you know, scoring six goals in the in the third period did not seem to have as much juice as it should have. Um, Jonah, anything going on college wise that we want to touch on before we wrap up? We've been at this for a while. Um, it's a little bit of a light week. Uh, kind of exam week blending into the break and not as much going on. UB football is getting ready to play that Camellia Bowl on December 27th and they're practicing, but news wise, not much has changed since we talked about that last week. Um, I don't very, uh, well, a little bit with UB, maybe just to mention safety Marcus Fuqua is a third team all American, which is pretty rare for a school like UB to have that kind of recognition leads the country in interceptions and a player coming in. A Lancaster graduate, Joe Andreessen, was an FCS All-American, and he's transferring into UB, and I talked about him today and going to be writing about him. So on the on the fringes of college coverage, there's a little bit of interesting stuff. And UB basketball coming up later in the month, they play at West Virginia on Sunday later in the week, and then they play at Michigan State on December 30th. So some somewhat interesting things to pay attention to with their team. And St. Bonaventure is winning some games, even though they lost the most recent one. but a little bit of a lull in the basketball schedule right now before it picks up with conference play next month. All right. Well, let's wrap it up and you know, we'll come back. Uh, Wait, well, next... let's, let me get one shout out. Niagara yeah. Community College basketball, number two in the country in division two, junior college undefeated beat ECC last night uh, has kind of an opportunity to have an undefeated non-conference portion of their schedule, which they I think they've done one time before. Uh, you know, this is a team that looks like it could be competing for a national championship come March. And the NCCC women's team receiving some uh, consideration in the national polls also, which I know has been common uh, with that program in the past. But uh, good to see uh, Nate Butel's crew um, getting some traction. Yeah, they've had some injuries. I mean, they've had record wise better seasons than they're having right now, but they're dealing with some injuries. and. I think that they will win their conference and be in the national tournament as they've been four years running now. And that's another strong program up there in Sanborn, New York. All right, Jonah, it's really early, but give me you know, just, you know, in a minute or two. What have we learned about the big four men's teams regarding tournament time? Is there, what should we, what should our expectations be as, as casual college basketball fans who are focusing on the bills now and it's non-conference time and it's really too early. Um, what have we learned and ter- what should our expectations be come j- late January and February when we're starting to really figure out uh, how invested we should be or what our expectations should be on, on these teams? Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of a cop-out answer in that it's still a little too early to right. figure out how these teams slot in their own conference because we have it. Uh, Niagara and Canisius did play two conference games. Niagara went 1-1. One one. Canisius went 0-2 in those on the road against two of the better teams in the MAC, but with Bana and UB. Like, I just don't know much about the rest of the MAC and the rest of the Atlantic 10. 
to quite figure out the pecking order there. And even people who think they know don't know until these teams start playing against each other. But I would say that Bonaventure looks like they're going to be competitive again. They have a winning record. They have a win against Notre Dame on a neutral floor. They played Iona very tough on a neutral floor. Mark Schmidt's doing what he always does, coaching these guys up. And I think it's going to be one of these seasons where they finish stronger than they started and they haven't started too poorly either. And UB is looking like they're putting it together with the different new parts and pieces and transfers. I don't know if they'll be as much of a contender in the MAC as they as fans have gotten used to seeing them be over the last few years. But I think they're going to have a uh, a winning season in conference play and be in the mix to possibly win that tournament and play in March. But I don't think there's any team uh, in the Big Four, men or women's basketball, that is a you know this is their year and we're expecting to see them playing in the postseason unfortunately i think it's a bit of a reset year for many of these teams and the one team we thought was going to be the best is the niagara women and they've actually had the worst start to the season of all of the local teams so there's you know it, it as is the case with all these new rosters in the transfer portal you can think a team's going to do something and then it it doesn't play out that way and niagara was niagara women was the team bringing the most back that we were the most sure of what we thought they were and they've uh, taken a step backwards because of injuries and just. But you have playing. to handicap not only the team, you know, the team that you, the team here in our backyard. You have to handicap, like you say, the entire with the transfer portal. You have to handicap the entire conference. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not. It's not the same as it used to be, where you could just look at returning starters, who those starters are. There are so many different pieces that need to work together um, that the coaches of these teams themselves don't know what they have probably until. January. Right. And you can take a look at where these guys came from and their stats in different leagues and what type of recruits they were and kind of put your own projections together as to who you think is the best team and the most talented team. But figuring out how all these players fit together and how they match up against other teams and how a conference season is going to play out. There's just too many moving parts to really be certain about how that is. And I think there's a lot of teams that are probably struggling now that are going to have good February and March performances and there's a lot of teams that look good now that are probably gonna uh, wither down the stretch in all of the leagues throughout the country jonah good alabama basketball you. with our, our you know our old friends nate oates and brian hodgson is number four in the country they're playing pretty well mike rodak getting to cover those guys big win over the tar heels recently and, they, and then they beat houston so they beat the number one team in the country twice this year better season alabama basketball or alabama football I'd have to ask Mike Rodak, but I'd say if you put expectations into the mix, probably Alabama basketball. Yeah. Of course, they could choke. But nah, yeah, but they're fourth not in the country choke. in football right now gets you in the right. playoff. It's looking but, uh, like Alabama, Alabama bas basketball has some really good freshmen. They're not going to miss the tournament. They might not. And, you know, you can be one of the best teams in the country and number one or number two seed and lose that first NCAA tournament game. And you can also be a team that, backs your way into a 12 seed and go well getting into the tournament playoff. is not tantamount to getting into the football playoff i would say you'd have to get like maybe sweet 16 or elite eight to have something that equates that right yeah but, and i think you know alabama basketball almost made the final four a couple of years ago and i think the expectation is not that they're going to do that every year but for them to really have a season that they're really excited and proud about uh, you know that's probably where the bar is set one of these years to be a final four team Friend of the show, NATO's. Yeah, an F. He is an F. Well, that doesn't guarantee an, uh, anything um, these days. Uh, I think we could look at uh, various Fs uh, who uh, are having things that aren't going well. OJ Simpson has been an F of the show. Yes, but I will say this. Everybody who's ever been an F of this show has come out of it, I think, looking better than they were coming in or if needed. As that, a guest on the show, you mean? Yeah. If you get the TJF rub, it usually goes well. Right. That's true. It's true. Um, we'll leave it at that. Jonah, see you soon. All right. Everyone out there, thanks for listening or watching to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants.